Welcome to a, another Intro to Sociology video class. Today we're talking about the sociology of aging, and I want you to think of three things that you associate with old age or with older people. And think about them for a second or two, and we would probably write those up on the board. And if I know some of you, <laughs> I know that there would definitely be some interesting words that came up on the board. And I'm wondering which one of those words, actually, if you had to apply them, um, would apply to your grandparents. Because often when we think about old age, we just think about it in general. We have a very large stereotype about what old age means. And I don't know, maybe senile, old, you know, crotchety old man. These are really common stereotypes of older people. But when you think about your grandparents, then you it's kind of good in helping you see that these stereotypes a lot of times are unfounded and just simply not true um, about old people. But you can see how they, maybe they, you know, they've developed over time. And so what we're talking about in this class, particularly today, is um, sociology and how sociology works and studies and looks at and helps to find aging. And so how do does society make sense of aging? And so um, here are all your usual suspects. Um, we're going to go through um, the first one we're going to talk about today um, in a new order. We're talking about uh, the social, I'm sorry, the symbolic interactionist. And so the symbolic interactionist always likes to view things from a constructionist kind of view. How does society construct meaning? And so while aging is a biological process, the symbolic interactionist looks at how societal ideas or how society applies meaning about what it means to be young or old. The social construction of age means that there's no inherent cultural meaning attached to the biological process of aging. So just like race, we had physical characteristics that for whatever reason uh, were grouped out separate from other physical characteristics to define different categories of people. And then sometimes we have to put meanings within those categories. So as far as aging goes, this is, um, we're not denying that there are biological differences between the young and the old. We're not denying that um, there are definitely um, indicators that somebody is aging, but the social construction means is, is more looking at what it means to be old. And so uh, when we look around the world, we look at Japan. So for instance, Japan, they really value their elderly. Um, adult children are expected to care for their aging parents. 65% of Japanese elders live with their children. And it's very deviant for a family to put an aging parent in an assisted living facility. Similarly, we have a um, area called the Abkhazia. So this is Abkhazians. This is right below Russia. The Abkhazians have been wanting independence from Georgia for quite some time. Um, and so, uh, but Abkhazia is still considered part of Georgia. Um, but this is the white area right here. And um, in Abkhazia, they honor their old and they seek their advice. They are considered the elders, kind of what you think of like the elders. Let's consult the elders. Well, the Abkhazians certainly do, and so do the Japanese. In contrast, we have um, the Tiwi Islands, which is right here on the north of Australia. And um, there's been um, a few anthropologists that have studied there and found that um, the clannish Tiwi, who live off the coast, they, uh, when, when their women become elderly, they become they kind of see them as feeble and they perceive them as being in the way the sons of that family will all agree to cover them up so this means they bury them in the sand up to their necks and they leave them there for a few days and then they return and if they are dead then they say that well it must have been their time to leave because they left them there and they were still alive and now they've they've passed away so um, it's interesting um, how vastly different we think of age and uh, I want to challenge you to think about age in the US so how we 
deconstruct the meaning of aging in the U.S.? Do you think that we kind of see our elders as good? Do we see our elders as wise to seek advice from? Or do we kind of see our elders as kind of being in the way? We definitely don't have a very good idea about aging. I don't think we have a lot of good narratives about aging. Um, and in the U.S., and and other Western societies, we tend to value youth a lot more than we value age. Um, there's a huge market for anti-aging products. We've got plastic surgery. We got medications. We've got Botox. We've got people will go people will go to great lengths to appear younger. And um, I know for sure my mother when we go out to eat and the wait staff who are of course working for tips. Um, casually refer to her as my sister and she gets a big kick out of that because she wants to appear younger um, we try to appear younger because we want to increase our social worth and so if we have a society that values youth then we don't want to have any of these symbols of aging so when we talk about symbols of being old um, you can go back to you know some of the things that you thought about earlier in the earlier slide, these biological changes. So biolo biological changes that occur as you get older, um, you develop more wrinkles, right? You also, um, your hair becomes more gray or white, or you might lose your hair if you're male, or even females tend to lose their hair as well. Um, we think of maybe poor physical shape, unable to move quickly, um, you know, brittle bones, you also um, might lack um, control over your bladder, you might not be able to see very well or hear very well, um, different things come up. Um, then we also look at bio biographical and cultural events. So these are kind of things, life events that happen throughout your lifetime. So you may become a grandparent. Um, what does that mean if you become a grandparent when you are in your late 30s? Does that mean you're suddenly old? Where is that line between old and young come into? What do you have to experience in order to be considered old? What symbols, what symbolizes old age in that predicament? Also, what about if you have poor health? Let's say you can't control your bladder, but you are in your late 30s. Does that mean that you are an older person? Um, also, retiring. So if you retire young or if you're still working when you're older, um, being widowed. So this is if you lose your spouse. Um, also, if you stop driving, we often think about older individuals as, as kind of, at some point, they, they quit driving. Um, but we actually know that up until the age of 75, that older drivers are actually much safer than younger drivers. Um, and then lastly, we have this kind of symbol when we talk about gender, whereas we see especially in beauty standards. And I think that this might be changing, but you have this idea that um, older men become more regal and that younger, uh, I'm sorry, older women, um, you know, aren't as attractive or something along those lines. Although I do believe that this has changed, um, especially with pop culture, which you look at like the, I don't know, what is it? American Pie and Stifler's Mom. Um, not to refer to something um, that that might be inappropriate, but this kind of does go along with the gender and age. Like, how do we construct the idea of gender and how people change according to gender? And this video right here is going to show you and challenge you to change your perceptions of old age. And so um, you could click on it if you have the slides open or if you're watching this on video, you would have an uh, icon up here on the right with a little eye. I'm gonna put a card in there so you can click on that and it will open up to this um, short film that is going to tell you kind of about this tribal um, idea. So what I want to, what I want you to get out of that video is uh, what type of society is the speaker learning from? You know, in traditional societies, how are people useful and significant? What are some of their significance within society? Um, it's also going to ask you about cultural values that emphasize respect for older people, 
in contrast with the lower status of the elderly in the U.S. And he talks about the Protestant work ethic. So values of self-reliance and the American youth cult are all reasons for this. And it's going to um, tell you about the marginalization of the elderly. I want you to think about two factors that make old people obsolete in non-traditional cultures. So I'd like you to get that from the film. And also, what are three values that older people offer to our society? So go ahead and watch that video and then come back to this video. Okay, so now we are looking at the functionalist perspective. So the first part of functionalist perspective looks at the disengagement theory. So this was the first theory of aging that developed or that was developed by social scientists in 1961. And this is the disengagement theory. It claims that it is natural and acceptable for older adults to withdraw from society and personal relationships as they get older. The theory has been largely debunked. They were trying to figure out why older people stop going to work, you know, why they may stop doing the same behaviors that they were doing before. And they felt like it was because the elderly were choosing not to go or, or the older people were choosing to disengage. So um, this disengagement model said that it was natural for the elderly to disengage, um, but they realized that um, that would mean that they were withdrawing from their primary roles. So like their careers, their marriages, if they were raising a family, um, that means that they'd be losing their social lives. And so that's super demoralizing. Um, definitely it was a theory that's been thrown out um, in exchange for um, what we call the activity theory. So this is the functionalist perspective kind of idea that social roles have to maintain some equilibrium. It has to function. So how can you function? Well, this theory predicts that older adults that face role loss, such as a career, um, will substitute former roles um, with alternatives. So for instance, my dad, my stepdad, he is retired. Um, and uh, since he's been retired, he's been very, very busy um, working on the farm. So instead of uh, working downtown, now he's working on the farm. This would kind of go along with his activity theory. And it's actually super important that they stay within those roles. Um, it kind of helps them transition. Okay, and so lastly, we have... Uh, the continuity theory. So the continuity theory sounds very similar to the activity theory. Um, this is that um, normal aging. Uh, it's that older adults will usually maintain the same activities, behaviors, and personality traits um, and relationships as they did in their earlier years. So this theory considers the internal structures and external structures of continuity and they describe how people adapt to their circumstances and they set, you know, their goals. And so they have, this is when you continue to sing in the choir, right? You continue to uh, be a part of your family. Um, anything that, that you were previously interested in, that's something that you can continue to do. And so long as you continue to do the same things, that um, this is a much easier transition as you get older and face some of these biological changes. Okay. Oops. All right, so next we have the conflict perspective. Okay. So this is the old and young are struggling for limited resources. So this perspective on aging maintains that whichever generation happens to be middle-aged at any given point in time is the most powerful compared to the young. Uh, members of the powerful generation act as gatekeepers and they orchestrate the distribution of resources and power um, to be in line with their own interests, often at the exclusion of the needs of other individuals and generations. So, um, of course, with the conflict theory, you're 
constantly looking at who has the power. If you think about competing for resources, also I, I think about my job, um, specifically at um, the college. How am I going to get into a tenured position when there's a lot of baby boomers that are occupying those positions at, at this time? And uh, if they do not pass the torch, if they do not leave, um, then I will be um, I will continue as an adjunct um, and I will not be able to fill those spots because those spots are very limited. Hopefully that, that is not the case though. Um, it also wants to look at the power elite in terms of exploiting the less privileged through programs like social security. So if you assume that you're going to be paid by social security, um, you are um, seriously in for a shocker. Um, so if Social Security was a social or is a social insurance program that's funded primarily through taxes and taxes are taken out of your paycheck each pay period, tax deposits are formally entrusted to funds that maintain the money and distribute allowances to qualifying elders. And so this money will go out as people get older. So long as you paid into Social Security, you should be able to take out um, or if or if you are a spouse of somebody that contributed to Social Security, you should be able to take some of their Social Security out. Um, so when the stock market crashed um, during the Great Depression, or what led to the Great Depression in 1929, um, the value of most Americans' retirement savings plummeted. So this is what brought about Social Security. And we're going to get a little bit more into that coming up, how Social Security is um, having some major problems. and. Lastly, we're going to talk about how race and gender have different scenarios according to aging. So your experience aging might be different according to your race or your gender. This is a very conflict kind of perspective. Okay, so. Oh, my slides are really sticky. Okay, so we have the effects of industrialization. So this goes without saying, but as industrialization or globalization comes around, we have a much higher standard of living. Um, it's easily to see, you know, what your parents had access to, uh, what their parents had access to. You're, you're probably able to have access to more of those things than they did um, in terms of cell phones, TVs, um, the food that you have. Um, air conditioning, all of these things are are a higher standard of living as industrialization has made that possible. So is globalization, right? It's helped the global economy kind of um, supply us with, with a lot cheaper items. Or, I don't know, I say they're cheaper, but that, you know, you can get more for your money. Um, also, we have a lower childhood mortality, so we see a lot less um, people are dying. Um, as children. So this leads to a much larger population. Also advances in medicine uh, have helped people stay alive longer. And we obviously have a lot less starvation now um, than we did in the past. Food production is um, has really came a long way um, since industrialization. So this has led to um, a life expectancy increase um, for people that are having fewer children. Uh, we also have access to birth control. So um, people are living longer, they're having fewer children. And so um, the older generation is beginning to outnumber the younger one. And that is what we're referring to as top heavy population, meaning that there are older, there are more older people than there are younger people. The question of a smaller workforce Funding Social Security is very concerning because if Social Security and healthcare have to be funded um, from a smaller workforce and you have more people that are retired that are that are pulling out of it, we're, there's just not going to be enough. And so um, it also goes along with healthcare in terms of um, you know pulling out of pulling out money for Medicaid or or filling the rooms within the hospital itself. Okay, so if you look at this projection, um, this is Social Security tax, revenues and outlays with scheduled benefits. And so this is, um, the outlays are the cost of running the Social Security program. 
including its benefits. And then the tax revenues is the money available for funding. This is this green line. Um, the money that is available for funding for Social Security. So you can see that there's a difference. Um, and so um, the program will no longer be able to fund itself unless payroll taxes are raised or maybe benefits are cut. So to, com so to compound the problem, the government borrows from the Social Security frequently to make up for other deficits that it has in its budget. And so as time progresses, fewer workers are supporting more beneficiaries. So in 1950, for instance, which would be way back over here, um, in 1950, 16 workers supported four retirees. In 2010, two workers supported two retirees. So the trend of workers supporting retirees is in a large decline and Social Security um, is endangered, especially as the government continues to borrow from it with impunity. So this is the elderly population growth by percentage of the entire population. So you see that the elderly are going to make a make up a higher percentage of our total population. And so what I really want to know is what y'all think about the implications of a growing aging population. What does this mean if there's a larger percentage of your population is 65 and older. What does that mean for retirement? You're going to have a lot of people that are retired. What is it going to mean for health care, social security? What about elder care? There's probably going to be a lot of demand for elder care in the U.S. Um, if, if you go to this film, well, you should go to this film. We would watch it in class, but I can't... Um, I can't force you to watch it here without clicking on it. So if you look over here on the right side, I'm gonna put a card there so you can click on it off of this uh, video and then come back. Um, or you can also find it in the slides on Canvas and the film will easily link out to you. But the video is just going to, to discuss some of those major concerns because this actually does uh, apply to you. This will definitely affect me and you um, as citizens um, in the U.S. and as um, things change. Also, I want to talk about uh, housing. So a lot of times, well, a lot of times, as people get older, uh, they, they either die or they move in with their families or they go into an assisted living facility and what happens to their homes? Well, I do think that the real estate industry might be a little bit concerned about this as well because there may be a lot of vacant homes as the demand for kind of homes in the suburbs kind of starting to decline as you know millennials and younger generations are wanting to live closer into into cities into urban spaces so it'll be interesting what happens with the real estate as time goes on um, so here you see the life expectancy at age 65 and at age 75 by sex, by race, and if you look at Hispanic origin um, between 1900 and 2017. And so if you wanna look at the life expectancy of both sexes, how much it's changed. So in 1900, uh, both sexes and all races, the life expectancy from birth was 47 years old, 47 point three years old that was how long you could expect to live on average obviously there were people that lived a lot longer than that and then here at tw you know 2017 we have 78.6 so um, that is quite a big shift between the two and you can see it's just gradually gotten better and better as uh, we're living longer and if you look at conditions for whites versus blacks what we do know in 1900 um, Blacks and African Americans, they didn't have the best living conditions. Um, they were not treated very well, especially if you were doing hard labor or you were a slave. So that would definitely uh, contribute to your health. We also know healthcare was not available or accessible um, for slaves. 
So um, I think that this may have been contributing to um, how the life expectancy changed. Now we know that in 1861 that was the Civil War. So um, in, in 1900 we have uh, we still have people that are living um, from 30 years ago or 35 years ago. So you can see that, that from 1900 to 1950 there's a huge expansion there as well. And so if you do go back and look again at um, 2000, 2017 you have uh, females living outliving males um, pretty significantly. You don't see um, you don't see the differences um, quite as stark uh, as you do in, in 2017, 2016. Um, let's see. I want to look back at I want to look back over here and see if there was much. Look at the differences here. So uh, men and women had very similar life expectancy in 1900. Um, and then there's this, this change right here. So I wonder what is going on with gender. Okay, and so this next slide, we're looking at um, ethnicity. We've broken up, obviously, uh, white, black, and Hispanic being a considered an ethnicity. So I considered, you know, how we do like to look at black, white, and brown. But, uh, but for whatever reason, we've not uh, made brown into a race. So it is a ethnicity, um, obviously not. Um, obviously Hispanics can be considered white or black like we discussed in race but um, I want to let you know that this chart was created as a result of a 2011 report by the CDC that asked them to analyze and dis discuss the trends here and so you know I actually So the figure above here is a bar graph, and it's showing the life expectancy at birth by sex and race, ethnicity in the United States during 2011. And in 2011, life expectancy at birth was 78.7 years for the total U.S. population, and then um, it was 76.3 for males and 81.1 .1 years for females, and then life expectancy was highest for Hispanics, for both males and females. Um, in each racial and ethnic group, females had a higher life expectancy than males. And uh, life expectancy ranged from 71.7 years for non-Hispanic black males to 83.7 years for Hispanic females. So why do you think that is? First off, why do you think there's a difference between male and female, which we kind of already talked about in the previous slide? And then why do you think that um, there's a big difference between Hispanics and the rest of the, of the culture, or the rest of the U.S.? Or specifically even for blacks, like why, why are black males the lowest um, amount of years lived versus um, Hispanic females being the highest? Is there a major difference between um, those two groups? Is there a lifestyle difference? That, that leads to this? Maybe it's cultural. I like to put this slide up because we do look at 2011 and think, man, data has really changed. And so um, in this slide, I put together um, the 2017 um, CDC report, and you can still see that, wow, um, for Hispanic females, it is quite higher than um, for black males and so this starts at 70 and so this you can see the stark contrast here um, between Hispanic females and really the rest of us <laughs> so um, it does make me kind of wonder what's going on with race there's a racial gap and here is a uh, link this would be a link to an article and if you're interested in that I can give you a link to it because it will not link out of this video for you. But um, you can re refer back to the original study at any point. So um, reading this quote, one of the ways to think of racial gap in health is to think of how many black people die prematurely every year who wouldn't die if there were no racial differences in health. And the answer to that from a carefully done 2001 scientific study 
is 96,800 black people die prematurely every year. If you divide that by 365, which is 365 days, um, that's 265 people dying prematurely every year. Um, imagine a jumbo jet with 265 passengers and crew crashing at Reagan Washington Airport today and the same thing happening tomorrow and every day next week and every day the next month. That would, um, that's what we're talking about when we say that there's a racial disparity in health. And so uh, this is done by a researcher, um, David Williams. He's a public health researcher, and uh, he's done quite a bit of research studies um, specifically that, that tie into race and, and why is there, trying to describe why there is a race gap and what that gap actually is. Um, mortality rates are a racial issue uh, for several reasons. This includes health care, uh, access to health care, um, also uh, lifestyle Right, so um, are you more willing to take care of yourself? Also, um, institutional mistrust. Now we see this a lot of times, and we see this also with not just um, with race, but we also see this with class. Um, if working class has got a lot more distrust um, in the institution of medicine, and uh, you know maybe they don't trust some doctor, and healthcare is really trying to change that um, because you know obviously these gaps are, are huge. Um, and also education. So the higher your education is, the more likely you are to seek health care and have access to health care. So um, these are all factors that factor into it. So we look at gender and aging. Um, obviously, uh, women are living longer than men. And the implications of this is that they typically become the caretakers for their spouses. And they outlive their spouses. So once they are widowed, um, they usually have quite a bit of isolation. Um, and they're the largest, they make up the largest percentage of nursing home patients. And they're also more likely to be poor. As you get older, you're not working, right? If you retire and uh, you've lost your spouse, um, you're eventually going, and you know, your health care expenses are a lot higher than your also a lot more likely to be living in poverty especially the longer you live if you're expected to retire at 65 and you're living to 80 well there's 15 years you got to make up for um, if you haven't planned for okay so um, here we're going to talk about dependency um, as you get older uh, this is we're still within the realm of cl the conflict theory um, but uh, so within dependency, you have uh, kind of losing the ability to care for yourself. And this can be a very difficult thing to accept. Um, as you get older, you've been an adult your whole life, and now suddenly you need the help of others to, to keep you, um, to keep up your standard of living. Um, so we have a lot of problems with nursing homes or with hospice care. And so uh, between nursing homes uh, they're, they're typically understaffed and uh, there's a lot of abuse and dehumanization neglect uh, going on at nursing homes I'm not saying that all of them are like this or that assisted living places are like this this is not every place so please don't get me wrong but you would be surprised at the numbers of nursing homes um, that there is some degree of neglect or abuse going on uh, it d does it takes a very special person to be able to to be a caregiver, take care of the elderly, um, and you're they're quite dependent on you, just like just like children. Um, so uh, in, in this film, um, I will link it over here on the card for you. But um, in this film, you're going to see um, some of the you know one just one account of the issues of dehumanization and abuse in hospice care or nursing care. Um, you just need to see the first uh, few minutes just to just to observe it, know that it's there because it's something that we need to be aware of. Oops. Okay, yeah, so death and dying. So this is for your class discussion. Uh, today, so if you um, watch this film, which uh, is linked for you, 
um, here, but also in your uh, discussion class discussion notes. And I want you to answer these questions. Um, what point is Peter Saul making in his talk? I and mean, how does he make this point? And lastly, do you agree or disagree with him? So when you are putting your class discussions up, just take one sentence to say, this is the point that Peter Saul is making. Then take one sentence to say, this is how he's making it. And then you can use the rest of the space to talk about um, whether you agree or disagree with him. Okay, so lastly, we have Kubler-Ross's uh, five stages. This should, this U should have an umlaut over it, two little dots um, that make it um, because she is Swiss. So uh, Kluber Ross was a Swiss psychiatrist, and she developed uh, the five stage or the five stages of grief model in her book on death and dying, and it's based off of her work with terminally ill patients. So she studied them. Kluber Ross um, later has came out to say that these stages are not linear. Some will, some people won't experience any of them, um, but you might experience one or you might experience all five. Um, these are very well-known stages of grief, so it wouldn't surprise me if you've heard of them. Um, sometimes they are discussed in psychology classes. And the first one um, is denial. So denial is the stage um, that can initially help you survive the loss. So you might think of uh, life, that life makes no sense anymore, that you've kind of lost meaning, that, that your life in particular has lost meaning, that, that it's way too overwhelming. Um, you start to deny the news, and in effect, you go numb. Um, it's common in this stage to wonder how life will go on in this different state. I will say that grieving um, during this COVID-19 process, although it's not like losing a loved one, it is still a grief process, and I will say that um, I did personally feel like it was very overwhelming, um, that it didn't make a lot of sense that I wasn't going to be able to come into school and actually see you face to face. And um, at first I just kind of wanted to ignore it um, or deny that the news was true, that this was even really that big of a deal. And if you see that a lot of even people within our um, our authority and, and, and our news sources, even they were denying um, the problems with COVID-19. And so um, it does seem a little bit shocking. So you go through this denial process. This happens with, with dying as well. So you learn that, that one of your friends is dying or you learn that you have cancer. Um, you may go through this denial state. The second stage is called anger. So once you start to kind of live an actual reality again, and um, you realize it's not your preferable reality, you might get angry. So anger will set in. This is the common stage where you think, why me? Like, this isn't fair. You might look to blame others for the cause of your grief, or you might also redirect your anger to close friends or family. Um, like, you could have prevented this, or this is your fault. Uh, you find it incomprehensible of how something like this could happen to you. And uh, this is also a stage where if you are religious, you might ask, you know, where is God? Why is, why is he not here helping me? Um, how could he let this happen? How could he let bad things happen to good people? These are the angry stages. Um, so the third one is what we call bargaining. And this is kind of like a false hope. This is, uh, when you falsely make yourself believe that you can avoid the grief through a type of negotiation. So maybe if I change this, then you'll change that, and then we can stay together. Or you just start kind of, you know, negotiating um, different scenarios. Um, another part of bargaining is guilt. And so um, this is when you endure the endless list of what ifs or what if statements that you make. So what if I had driven her to work? What if I had, you know, done any of these things differently? Maybe this wouldn't have happened. Maybe if I hadn't eaten or so many Cheetos, I wouldn't be having this problem. <laughs> okay. Um, no, you don't have a problem with Cheetos? All right. Well, donuts, beer. Maybe if I didn't drink so much. Um, 
maybe I could stop this, right? Maybe I could get healthier. Um, I, I, my uh, uncle, if we go back to bargaining, um, my uncle recently passed away from cancer, but when they found out that his can uh, cancer was stage four, they were still um, in quite doing quite a bit of bargaining. Um, they did not believe that he was going to pass away, although it was quite certain that he was. And um, he said that he was going to start exercising and he got on a diet um, thinking that that was going to help him. Um, but And he had me pretty well convinced, although my parents were fairly certain that he was, that he was passing. I wasn't there to see him um, personally, so all I heard was from talking to them on the phone and he definitely thought that he was going to beat this thing. So, um, and his wife did, my aunt, um, also believed the same thing. And so, uh, they were both bargaining. So, um, you can lose your, you can lose your life, um, still being in this bargaining stage. Okay. So the, the next one is depression. So depression is commonly, um, as a commonly accepted form of grief. So we typically think of if you've lost a loved one or if you're about to, to, to die, um, or if you get some kind of diagnosis, um, we're likely to, to get more depressed. We kind of expect people to be down in the dumps. But with depression, um, it it's represents this emptiness that you feel when you're living in a reality and you realize that the person or the situation is gone or over. And in this stage, you might withdraw from, from your life. Um, you might stop wanting to do the things that that you were really interested in and um, just kind of uh, be stuck in this kind of state of withdrawal and lastly we have acceptance and so this is the stage of grief that kubler ross identified as uh, not having um not exactly having a sense that everything's okay it's you're not saying like well it's okay that that i'm going to die or it's okay that my husband died um, but rather that my husband is dead and it's good, but I'm going to be okay. Like, so things have happened. Um, it sucks. And, um, so you're not saying that I'm perfectly okay with it, but you are realizing that you are going to be okay in it. So with COVID-19, you might be at this acceptance stage where like this, where, where I'm at um, currently is like, like, well, this sucks and I don't get to see you and I don't get to lecture to you directly, um, or see your faces and see how you're getting this information. I realize half of y'all can't even zoom. That was my bargaining stage was hoping that more people would, would be able to zoom, um, at the same time. But, you know, realizing that, that none of that is possible. I finally come into this acceptance that, um, you know, I've stabilized a bit. I'm reentering a, a new reality and, uh, I'm coming to terms with the fact that the new reality, um, that we're never going to be in a classroom together. Um, you know, and, and that's okay. You know, we have to make the best of it. Um, it's definitely not a good thing, but it's something that we can definitely live with. And so that would be your acceptance piece. I know applying it to class is, is maybe a little bit of a stretch, but it's, but it is true. Um, but the acceptance can happen, um, throughout any grief process. So I'm not trying to equate losing class to losing a loved one, but all of these stages still apply. Um, and so that is it as far as this lecture goes. And I hope to see you next time.